Hey guys, this is Emily Bowen Moore, or Professor Bowen Moore. Um, I am going to go over just a little bit of an intro um, to the course and talk about graphic design in this lecture. Uh, but first, let me share my screen with you. Um, the one thing that I want you to be aware of is, you know, this is a skills course. That's why it's very rigorous. Um, and it's there, we're, you know, it's to get you more aware, give you more skills in your ability of coming up with creative solutions, giving you hands-on exposure to the software that are the industry standard and the tools that people use to, to execute uh, your visual messages. So it's just to make you aware, get you the terminology and vocabulary that's involved and all of that. If you look at your syllabus, um, before each major project, there's going to be a um, assignment sheet that tells you the detailed expectations and requirements for that assignment. Uh, so it's important that if you don't understand something or if something seems confusing, you know, you need to contact me as soon as possible. Don't wait till the last minute. Don't wait till after the fact. Uh, that'll never be an acceptable excuse um, if you wait and, and don't communicate with me. Uh, so make sure that you are doing that. Know that I'm here for you um, throughout the semester or throughout the term. Um, in your syllabus, it'll give you the percentage of what each of the projects count. Uh, so you'll have three major projects that will total 60% of your grade. Uh, your quizzes, but you will have one each week. So in the, in the term, first term summer session, there will be four. Um, those collectively will count 15% of your grade and the minor projects and practices, which you will have several of those, they're small, but you will have about eight of those actually. Um, those will total to 25% or a quarter of your grade. Um, so be aware of what each thing counts. Um, most people think that a process um, especially in a design project, it's just easy. You, you come up with a concept and you execute it. That is as easy as pie, you know, straight line from beginning to end. But that's completely far from the truth. Um, there's a lot of hurdles along the way. Sometimes you find out some of your ideas aren't working. You have to go and back to the drawing board and kind of rework some of your concepts and then test them again. And um, so, you know, you need to trust the process um, as, as much discomfort as it can provide sometimes um, and it's putting you out of putting you out of your comfort zone for a reason and that's where the growth happens so just trust the process know that it each project is a process we have multiple deadlines throughout the week um, so make sure you are pacing yourself and that you are um, paying attention to your deadlines um, in that regard and, and what's due at each part of the process. Um, we do give you an opportunity to redo um, two of your major projects, the resume and the poster project. Um, that's if you have made your deadlines along the way. We usually have a sketch deadline, a draft deadline, and a final deadline. So it is, like I said, a process. So just make sure that you're pacing yourself and turning things in on time. Um, to have eligibility for a redo if you are not happy with your grade. Um, usually the redos are graded more harshly. Um, they have to be considerably better than your first attempt. Um, you have to turn in your old design with your grading rubric um, along with your new design, new rationale in your new digitally packaged folder. Uh, so um, that will be important to remember those specifications and I will have a redo folder set up in box uh, where we turn in all your projects. The deadlines are absolute in this field and in this class. So if, there, if you are confused about when things are due, um, you need to let me know, but these are absolute. Um, so late work will be penalized um, by a half of a letter grade each day that it's late. Um, this class is all about visual communication and messages. 90% um, or most of all the information that we take in is usually visual. Um, so we have to think about how that works. Um, it's pretty fast, actually. 
Um, we usually pick up things very easily with our sensory perceptors. Um, we read images a lot faster than we do text. Um, even though visual messages do contain text, um, our brain is hardwired to um, read visual messages in general. And when we're producing a design, it's like I said, it's a process. There's steps to it. We, we look at what's before us, um, the parameters that we're given, and we try and conceive a concept that will work around that. Um, then we build on that concept. We start on paper, we sketch, we redefine, we test it through low fidelity prototyping, very raw, easily manipulated ways that we can test our ideas against one another. Um, and then once we kind of solidify what's working, then we can produce a digital version that's more refined um, and then get feedback on that in a more high fidelity prototype that's more of a, a more refined rough draft. Um, and we may have some more edits at that stage. They're usually gonna be more minor edits, but nonetheless, um, they are uh, you know, stages and, and steps to make it in more improved. And then once we add, put it out in the world, then we can, you know, really uh, uh, analyze the feedback. So what is graphic design? You know, we look at this term and all the time and, and there's many definitions. Most of us think it's just the computers. Um, we use Photoshop, InDesign, and Illustrator for most graphic design. That's the industry standard. Um, but is the software graphic design? Uh, no, it is not. You know, the ideas are coming from the person behind the computer. Um, so these are just our tools. These are just what helps us execute our concepts. Um, and design is content. You know, if there's poor content, the design will not make up for it. We can, you know, so we've got to think about how to critique it objectively. You know, what is the message? Is it clear? How can we, you know, is it conveyed effectively? If not, how can we make it effective? Um, there's a lot of nonverbal tools um, that we can use to amplify and add nuance and dimension to the content of the message and make it more clear. So, you know, what is the context? What are the constraints and parameters? What are the tools we're using? So if we look at, this is just some, uh, my example of, some resume content here. And right now I just have it aligned left and all the information is here. But as you can see, you know, is it clear? Not really, you know, it's kind of daunting to even read through. Um, can it be a, uh, more conveyed or conveyed more effectively? Yes. Um, so we've got to think about the context um, of this and how we can use our tools of design to make this better. Um, so, Here's more of a final version where we've worked with design and added design to the page. Uh, we're thinking about proximity. We're thinking about categorizing, categorizing our uh, types of information, um, similar items being in the same category. Uh, we're looking at aligning things um, that work well on the page to make it more easily readable. You know, so, so design does help and is, is a great way to uh, add clarification to the message. Design is also a perception. So if we look at these three bars, and if I were to ask you what is the most stable one, you know, most people would say the middle one here because it's just laying flat on the ground. However, if we got into this layout and we added some simple geometric shapes, we could change that perception. You know, we could um, add a triangle under the first one. You know, that one's not too stable now. Uh, the middle one is no longer stable. Now the right side is, looks like it would be the most stable. So we can change that perception. Same with this one. Right now, these bars look the same height, same width. But if we go into this and we add some angled lines and change the pers perspective, um, we can make one bar look further back than the other and it makes them look like they are not the same height anymore. 
And design is also an artifact. I mean, we, if we look at this poster from the 60s for Jefferson Airplane, we can see uh, this resurgence of um, Art Nouveau here, the bright colors, the, the trippy and groovy text um, on the page. Um, in the 70s, we have this resurgence of Art Deco, you know, coming back, this glitz and glam, um, and, you know, the type is very Art Deco here. In the 80s, um, you know, we have the Frankie Goes to Hollywood type, uh, bold serif or sans serif type face here, which is Helvetica that they used. It was invented in the late 50s. Um, but we've got this resurgence of, you know, the, the Swiss international style of the 60s. And then in the 90s, we um, have this grunge, uh, you know, movement where a lot of handwritten text was was presented and, you know, things were a little bit more juxtaposed. But design is, is an artifact. Um, and usually that artifact is, is the result of a creative process. Um, and that process takes place in a specific cultural environment. And usually that reflects or shapes its culture and are organized around those specific ideas uh, that are reactions to the culture of the times. And if we looked at, look at different graphic design disciplines, there's many avenues for graphic design. Uh, we work with branding and identity design, you know, creating the, a consistent visual appearance and personality of a brand and all of its, um, you know, co-defining um, identities and in, anything that's an entity that goes along with that brand, whether it's signage or web pages or mobile apps or whatever it is. Um, editorial design uh, for print or screen. Anything that's interaction or experience design or UI UX, uh, which is basically designing for technology um, and the interactions between people and technology. So any situation where the user interacts with the design, um, that includes mobile design for platforms such as iPhone, uh, Windows Phone, mobile web, um, advertising and promotional design that is designed to inform or persuade or promote or motivate people in some way on behalf of a brand or an individual or entity. Um, and typographic design, you know, visual messages don't always have to have pictorial images with them. Um, so letter forms and typefaces and other type treatments are also a strong form of design. Saul Bass, uh, his definition of graphic design was design um, is thinking made visual, um, which is a true statement. Um, he was a famous graphic designer and filmmaker. He was more known for his animation motion picture title sequences, but he came up with the Bell Systems logo in 1969, as well as the AT&T logo in 1984 um, as it was revised. You know, strong design, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to think about um, how it's getting its message across. You know, you, you basically are reading the message with no effort whatsoever. Um, these receptacles are a perfect example here. Um, I think these came, these are from an airport, um, but we don't, they don't have a label on them, but we don't have to think about where stuff goes in these receptacles. We know one is for recycled cans or bottles. We know one is for general trash and discard, and um, the another one is for paper. So a lot of feedback I get from students sometimes with this class, a lot of times, is I'm not creative, I'm not the creative type. Um, so let's talk about what creativity is. You know, how many of you are creative? How many of you are not creative? How many of you are not sure? Um, so most of the misconceptions revolving around creativity um, are attached to artistry. So if someone can draw or paint or is crafty, then they are creative. Um, but although artistry can certainly be used to be creative, you know, that's very one-sided and doesn't really get to the whole heart of creativity. Um, 
most people are perceived as being creative who have no artistic ability. And the reason for that is, you know, we're problem solvers. Human beings are problem solvers and creativity requires, all it is is problem solving. Um, so the common element there is, is that, you know, it's problem solving. You know, creativity is meeting a need or finding a solution. And we solve problems every day from the moment we get up in the morning to the moment we go to bed at night. So we're all problem solvers. Therefore, you know, we all have the capability of being creative. But there's two types of creativity. We have relevance, um, which is the degree by which the problem is actually solved. You either solve the problem or you don't. You know, that's a pretty either or situation. But we also have novelty, which is a more important aspect of creativity. And that is the degree of uniqueness or originality of the solution. Um, so what makes a solution creative is its degree of differentiation from other solutions. So the, usually the, the strongest creative solution is one that is unexpected. So if I give you an example here, if I give you some eggs, some bacon, and some bread and tell you to make breakfast, what would you do? So most people would agree that making toast, scrambling an egg, and then cooking the bacon, that solves the problem. And that is agreeable. You know, that is um, a creative solution. You know, we have solved that problem. But we also can be more creative with this solution. You know, what if we grill the bread in a skillet, cut a hole in the middle of it, pour the egg inside, cook it till it's sunny side up, and then top it with crumbled cooked bacon. You know, we still have relevance because we did solve the problem, but we also have novelty. That solution is creative to the extent that it is differentiated from the norm of most common solutions. So that's what I challenge you with this class. You know, most people can come up with the solution, but how creative of a solution can you be, have? Um, and that's the important part. So I just challenge you to push yourself to come up with the most creative solutions in this class. And good luck.